Hey everybody, Alex Kazura, SteelersDepot.com, back for our Monday live stream here. Just going to be me today, give me one second, I'm a little behind, Ben just had his podcast go up as he always does on Monday, and so let me um, get on track here to pull up the stream on my phone so I can talk with you guys, as always, here till 8 p.m. Eastern Time, bumping up the schedule because of the uh, Monday night game in week 12 figured it was not a good idea to have the Monday live stream which normally would have been scheduled for next week um, to do that uh, then so we bumped things up a week now give me one second to take this image off trying to make the stream look slightly and I mean slightly more professional but um, yeah just me unfortunately because I changed the schedule here so that's really more on me um, Dave has a doctor's appointment and that's obviously the most important thing for him right now. Um, so it's just me you have to listen to for the next hour, but I promise, um, Dave will be on for the, the next live stream, which we will have two weeks from now. So if you guys could just let me know if you can hear me, if the audio sounds okay. Uh, if so, then we will start by answering your questions until 8 PM Eastern time. And so just give me a quick check here. And, uh, and also, if you guys could like the stream, I certainly would appreciate that. That would bring more people into the chat. Things sound good. I also apologize. I know I always sound nasally to begin with, which is a whole another boring story. You don't want to hear it. But I have the most just chap lips ever. This cold winter is killing me. I got this new humidifier, and it just, I don't know, it's it's destroying my, uh, my chap lips. I have no chapstick, so I'm probably going to sound more lip smacky than usual. So my apologies, many, many of those. In advance, but uh, glad you guys can hear me. Again, if you want to have your question be guaranteed to be asked and answered, you can send us a super chat. Move to the front of the line. Um, no obligation to do so, but they're always appreciated. But we will move to the questions right now, as you can read about Ben's thoughts on Kenny Pickett as the Steelers come off their 37 to 30 loss to Cincinnati on Sunday, dropping Pittsburgh to three and seven on the year. We'll kick things off with our friend Mutated Genome says, Hi Alex and Dave, your thoughts on Pickett's accuracy. Is it his nerves in the pocket or just poor fundamentals causing some of his wildly erratic passes? I'm just beginning to go through some of the All-22. I It probably wouldn't be nerves. To some extent, there's pressure that can influence things, but I wouldn't categorize those as nerves. I, I, I doubt Pickett probably has a lot of nerves at this point. He's started a handful of games on the road at home. Maybe the primetime game Monday will be a little bit different, kind of that last new thing to do because he's yet to play. Um, no, he did play in a primetime game, though, right? Miami was a primetime game, so what am I saying? Um, so he probably, I think all the nerves are likely out of the way at this point. Um, I think fundamentally, some of the things that Tyler Wise has talked about over striding and things like that and just overall footwork, those things are generally going to influence accuracy more than maybe some sort of intangible mental makeup, which I think, Pickett has a pretty strong constitution, so I think that's probably more of the issue than it would be anything internally with him. Uh, let's see here. Next question comes from Jason, our friend, says, Hello, Dalek. Sadly, in the second half of our Steelers collapse, harder than Oakland's I-80 and, and 89. Dang, earthquake reference there. That's pretty hardcore. How much do y'all think the fault lies with Kenny accuracy and how much is on the OC? It's a bit of both. Again, still working through some of the game, you know, off the top. The second and long calls I didn't love. They were in second and seven plus 14 times yesterday. They passed the ball seven times. They ran the ball seven times. You don't want a 50-50 split there. Um, the stats are pretty clear that running on second and long is kind of running into death in terms of the football world, putting yourself in third and long against a Bengals team that gets really blitz heavy and showing a lot of sim pressures and things like that, trying to sow seeds of chaos on third and forever. And I thought Pittsburgh, by running the ball in second and long, was really kind of putting themselves into those moments. I know they wanted to establish the run and commit to the run the way they did against the Saints, and that was probably the mentality behind it, but um, didn't like that from Canada. Uh, outside of that, I don't know if there were other things that I can really pinpoint to. Um, still, again, still working through the game to kind of talk about some of those issues. A lot of it's just small things that become big things, like one guy with a miscommunication that leads to a, a, a busted play call and what should have been a draw that leads to a penalty, that leads to this team being really backed up, that leads to a sack, that leads to a punt, that leads to a score, and you get the picture. So oftentimes it just it's a bit of that popcorn, to use the Tomlin reference and, and, and 
ward there that leads to this team uh, hurting itself so much with all those uh, unforced errors. Double HH with a very generous $20 super chat, so thank you for that. We lost a track meet last night by the 50-meter mark. What four positions of need would have made a difference in a future track meet? I'm thinking from the perspective of, of our first four draft picks next season. Again, I wish I had a great list where I could just say, these are the four spots to take, and and, and that's going to solve all those things. Um, I don't off the top of my head right now. I mean, I think some of the things are pretty obvious. Uh, you would love to have a number one type corner. You know, how do you deal with T. Higgins? I have an article in the morning on the site that talks about all the ways that uh, the, the Bengals creatively use T. Higgins from different alignments and splits and bunches and things like that. And you know, He torched all the Steelers' top corners, Levi Wallace, Arthur Millette, Cam Sutton. So you know, there isn't really that true number one guy, some number two types in, in Wallace and Sutton. Millette's a, a situational guy playing far too many snaps right now for my liking. Um, so that would obviously help. Number one corners do not grow on trees. They're tough to find. They're expensive in free agency, and they usually command a top 10 type draft pick. Uh, trench play still would be important to me overall in the, the bigger scope of improving this offense. Um, receiver would probably be a consideration as well. But I think you really felt not having that that real top end corner. Akella Witherspoon has the talent to be that guy, but it's never come together consistently over a long period of time for him. It's been flashes, including the last four to six weeks of last year. You saw that with Akella Witherspoon, but uh, has not been able to replicate that, and that is the story of his career. But uh, thank you for the super chat, Double HH. Have another one from Dead Planet. I did like the Kenny escape to throw in not to run. Yeah, I think, you know, I thought in training camp, one of the better traits that he showed was keeping his eyes up as he moved. You know, he's, he's a guy that's running to throw and not running to run in a sense of he's not someone that's trying to take off immediately. You've seen that more of him just looking to run um, outside the pocket and not keep his eyes downfield in recent weeks, which is probably pretty typical for a rookie quarterback. They have mobility. They want to lean on that as an asset. And, you know, you can't throw a pick scrambling. It's kind of the mentality of the thought, I'm sure. And so I thought he did a good job, kind of what he showed more in camp and uh, when that was obviously a, a less pressure, less intense environment where you can't get hit to keep his eyes up. I thought the best play he made probably was an early third down completion to Jalen Warren, feeling the blitz, um, using his mobility to buy time and slide to his right, but also keeping his eyes downfield, finding Warren and converting on third and eight. Thought Pickett did a really good job in the first half of converting on some of the third and long situations you typically don't want to be in. Um, second half, it, it got worse. Uh, him and this offense dealing with third and long, and that was one reason why this this offense stalled out in the second half. But good point there, Dead Planet. Going back up to our friend John Pennington says, Dave and Alex, what do you guys think about the Cincy player telling our players that our team runs the same plays over uh, and over again? Yeah, that was Jermaine Pratt, the linebacker. I know that he had a um, tackle on Steven Sims on one of the jet sweep plays. Again, you hear that stuff more after a, a win than a loss, and Pittsburgh's offense is not the most complex or you know the biggest playbook in the world, which is expected with a rookie quarterback and a pretty young and new team overall. So, nothing that really I'm going to think about too much. I just I'm going to focus on the tape and see what patterns I pick up on. Again, I think the first four or five weeks of the year was really poor from a Canada game planning schematic standpoint. I think more recently over the last again five six games or so. It's been better from a schematic standpoint, not perfect, but better. And it's been more of an execution player standpoint. And so I've been a little less critical of Canada, but again, there were certainly things to talk about. And I mentioned my frustration with the second and long runs that I thought really hurt this team and put them into so many third downs in general. They had 17 third downs yesterday that 25% of their total plays were third down and they were decent on third down, especially in the first half, but the luck kind of ran out in the second half. I don't know what the exact splits were, first half, third down success versus second half, but I can promise you uh, first half success far better than the second half, and that was because you can't be in third and seven forever. They had, I think, 11 of their 17 third downs were third and seven or longer, and you can't consistently win that way. And again, I think that's one reason why this offense struggled because they had a bit of a... They were overperforming on third and long in the first half, and that kind of regressed to the mean in the second half is the, the quick analysis there. 
Mike Adesso, hi Alex. Okay, after ten games played, how would how would letter grade out each individual on the O line? Just the five starters. Seems to me they've made big strides since the preseason. They have. In terms of letter grades, I don't know right now. I think James Daniels has been the best offensive lineman. I've talked about how Kevin Dotson's the first guy I would look to replace on the O line starting the offseason. He's got talent, he's got potential, but it's just a frustrating player to watch, as you guys saw in the video that I put out this past week on the channel and on Steelers Depot. So that's probably where I start. I think all those guys have grown and gotten better. I think Mason Cole's been generally steady in the middle, and I can appreciate that, especially coming off a year where you had a total lack and absence of steadiness and consistency with a rookie in Kendra Green. So there's been a big benefit there. Dan Moore's independent hand use is really impressed, and he's gotten much more comfortable with uh, Pat Myers' teaching, uh, as has James Daniels, who was maybe taking the biggest jump from a guy that really struggled in the summer, adjusting to the different pass sets and the way that Pat Meyer wants things in terms of the aggressiveness of the sets, and Daniels has really cleaned things up. And a core force been generally the same guy, I would say a bit above average in pass pro and probably below average as a run blocker and as an average right tackle overall who kind of does his thing and he's available and durable and um you know he's kind of a maxed out guy despite being 25 years old so in terms of letter grades i don't have them for you now after the season i can probably give you some but they could and may change from now until the end of the year so i try not to put maybe exact letter grades on it uh midway through the year bruce myers if the season ended today which is the top impact player the steelers should draft at uh, number eight left tackler corner it just depends on who's there, to be honest. I mean, both of those, you know, guys are playing premier positions, and so the value could be high at both left tackle and corner. Um, so it's not maybe there might not be a lot of consideration in terms of what's more important if you're talking left tackle versus off ball linebacker or even left guard versus left tackle. Different equation, uh, receiver versus left tackle or corner, something like that. So I would probably lean corner right now just because I think Dan Moore can be a better left tackle than any of the the upsides of, of the cornerbacks on the current Steelers team, but it really depends on the person and how they fit schematically and, and all those things. It's tough to really answer those questions in a vacuum and consideration should, and I imagine would be given uh, to both positions there, Bruce, if that scenario played out. Got some more Super Chats. Well, I've got three of them, so thank you guys so much. Appreciate that. Again, if you could like the stream, um, also would be a big help, so even if you can't or don't, donate which is totally acceptable totally fine liking the stream truly helps out a lot in the uh in the youtube algorithm uh chad samora what do you think of dan moore's game on sunday he was bad in my opinion again still working through some of that i don't think bad was the first word that came to mind i know on that whole horrible sequence there i think it was the uh I don't forget if it was a third and 25 sack, whatever sack that was where Hubbard, uh, you know, came in free off the edge and, and Moore uh, lost his matchup to, I believe, Hendrickson. That looks bad, and I imagine that's not a good rep for Dan Moore, but Kenny Pickett taking a kind of a funky drop, seven-step drop out of the gun. It was kind of more of a backpedal. I don't know if he was trying to gain ground because Hubbard was going to come in free and Pickett wanted to throw hot there, and the hot guy never, the hot route never really opened up, and the Bengals dropped some of their interior guys, and kind of took that stuff away. So I wonder if Pickett was kind of trying to back up to buy time. But when you get so much depth in the pocket, you know, those tackles have a really tough time of sealing the edge when the, the end doesn't have to go through you or it just has to go around you and, and, and it makes that, that angle easier. So, um, again, have to go through some of the tape. The holding call on that, um, you know, uh, missed touchdown, would-be touchdown to Pickens. I'll have to go back and check as well. But that's not the first word that came to mind. But judging offensive linemen live can be difficult to do. And so I want to go back and, uh, and and watch that one. Tim Chase says, with a $5 Super Chat, has the Steeler way of doing things become outdated? Seems like young, innovative coaching becoming the thing now. I mean, to be fair, Mike Tomlin was the youngest head coach when they hired him, you know, seven. So that in itself was not always innovative, but it was, you know, a, a young move and it followed the model of Chuck Knoll and Bill Cower, who were both among the youngest coaches when they were hired. So, um, you know, I think the Steeler way, I get what that means. I understand some of the uniqueness of how the Steelers operate, but some of that stuff is just platitudes and cliches and things that sound good in a voiceover for the Hall of Honor Museum or whatever. I'm just making stuff up. Um, and it doesn't always necessarily mean a whole lot. Now, has the model changed, and should they change their approach or doing business when it comes to 
free agency and draft picks and things like that. I understand that's probably what you're getting at when you say things like steal away. And sure, there's merit to that. Should they be heavier in analytics? They probably should. And we'll see what Andy Weidel can do. And again, I think the the point to make in terms of the the approach and how this team will will operate, um, this is really the first time this upcoming offseason that Omar Khan and Andy Weidel will get to build the roster in their vision. I know Khan was obviously on staff and worked with Colbert so closely and so much, but you know him and Andy Weidel, who was an outsider from Philadelphia, were not hired until late May, and that's after the draft and after the bulk of free agency. And so they really have not had time to build the roster the way they want to. Most GMs come in about 90% of the time. Those guys come in 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 January, early February, and they get to go through that whole offseason process and have their roster essentially mostly shaped. There's always more changes in year number two, but mostly shaped by their first year. Not the case in Pittsburgh. That's why I was basically the lone voice who was pretty critical of Kevin Colbert staying on until after the draft. I think if you're going to exit as GM, you exit immediately as the season ends and let the new regime come in and build the roster the way they see fit. But that's all spilled milk um, at this point. But I think we'll see Con and, and Weidel really get to make their their changes and put their stamp on this roster. We'll see what that looks like. It'll probably be some different things. It'll probably be more aggressive moves and certainly at the least a fair amount of turnover because you have an outsider in Weidel coming in. Con, who's certainly a different background than, than what Kevin Colbert was. And I think we'll see changes there in pretty substantial ways. We'll see what happens, though, uh, Tim. Lou Boy, good to hear from you, Lou Boy. Been a little bit. I think Pickett to Pickens is going to hurt us more than it helps us. A $5 super chat. Um, not really sure the context for that. I think, you know, Pickens has been that sole source of downfield plays. So There's an element you don't want to force things and uh, be too concentrated on that. So maybe that's your point there. And I understand that, Lou Boy. But I think Pickens is one of the young stars on this offense. And as he grows, this game still has to grow and get more refined and be a better route runner. But I'm seeing progress there, seeing him win in more ways than just vertical concepts. And and so I think I'm encouraged by that. But um, I have no issue with the with throwing to George Pickens right now because he's been uh, one of the better weapons on this team consistently and especially as of late. Let me get a drink of water here real quick. Then I'll get to uh, Chupa Thingy's very generous $20 Super Chat. All right, says uh, Chupa Thingy says, watching the game three times, it seemed to me like the Bengals obviously made halftime adjustments, but it's very apparent, at least to me, it appears like Canada stuck to the same plan with none. When will he adjust in game? Again, I hate to give the answer, but because we do these on Mondays, the tape had just come out a little bit ago. Kind of have to go back through some of that stuff. I mean, Canada tried some different things. The flea flicker is certainly different. You can like it or hate it, and most people probably hate it in part because it did not work. Uh, That was something different. That was an adjustment uh, to make. Now, did it work? No, and and that's ultimately all that matters, how you get judged by, but um, that was something, and that was, you know, one of the biggest missed opportunities of this game. You had that 33-yard completion to Pickens right sideline. You go tempo, trying to go quick with the flea flicker. If that works, that totally changes the tone and tenor of the game. Obviously, it did not work, so... I just have to go back through, and I think you have to find more specificity in terms of maybe that's a valid point, and Canada did not change, but what are some of those specific things that we're talking about? Whenever I try to critique Canada, I try to be very measured and uh, very clear and specific to, okay, here are my critiques. When I did the critique of the sprint outs, I went back through the tape and watched every single game up until that point to categorize the sprint outs, down distance, what was the route combination, Those kinds of things when I talked about his first and 10 usage of a certain play, you know, how often was it used seven times on first and 10 from the yard line to yard line and things like that. So I just try to be very specific in that critique so it doesn't sound too vague and too catch all. And sometimes it loses meaning um, when, when you hear things like he didn't adjust or he was too predictable. That may be true, but without getting really kind of into the details of it, it's hard to really address that too specifically. So um, sorry about that Chupa thingy. But thank you again for the very, very generous $20 Super Chat. And I know you've been here for a lot of these live streams, so uh, Dave and I certainly appreciate that. Let me go back up here to the top and find some more questions that were non-Super Chats. Uh, Mike Adesso of Warren is that Would you play McFarlane over Snell in the Warren role, but maybe uh, a little less use? Well, Warren's primary primarily uh, role, primary role, I should say, is third down usage, and McFarlane cannot pass protect. So I would not be using... 
McFarland in that situation. I would certainly rather have Benny Snell in, in pass pro than Anthony McFarland. Could you have some um, rundown situations where he gets involved? Maybe, but I'm not really counting on on that right now. But certainly would not play McFarland on third downs. Uh, dead planted about Pickett having a good game. It was a good first half. Second half, I wouldn't call that good. But I thought that that first half was the best half I've seen him play of his young career. I was really encouraged by that. Beating the blitz on third down. Obviously putting points on the board. Uh, making good decisions. And so I thought he played a really strong first half of football. I was not alone in that assessment. But the second half, and that's not all on him, of course. But the second half um, you know, really took the win out of the sails of, of what could have been a, a really strong game start to finish. David O, our friend and contributor for the site, David O. Uh, Alex, what positives did you see coming out of this game? Anything we can look forward to? Um, yeah, I'm not, I do have winners on the on the winners and losers list. So, I mean, you know, I thought George Pickens and Pat Frymuth. I think Frymuth has really come into his own, and, and I'm glad that Pittsburgh has allowed him to be more of a vertical threat this year. He's got seven catches of 20-plus yards this year. I think he only had two his rookie year on 60 receptions. So um, they've been better using him, and his hands are incredible, and uh, his blocking has improved to some degree, but a better blocker out in space. Uh, the pass rush got going in the second half. You saw Hayward uh, with that just crazy potent bull rush, and long arm, and so crafty on stunts, and, and Watt, and, and Highsmith, and those guys making plays. The defense created splash. Um, they were plus two in the turnover differential. They took care of the football. Kenny Pickett's not thrown an, an interception in the last two weeks. So those were all good things. Matthew Wright bounced back. Presley Harvin punted well. Marcus Alame plays on kick coverage. Um, all those kinds of things come to mind right now. They were good on first, or they were good on third down in the first half, although they were in too many third and longs. But they converted. Pick it again, a really strong first half of play. So those are all positives. There's always positives and negatives that come out of every single game. And despite the loss that essentially puts the nail in the coffin that is the Steelers' season, um, there were still positives to take away, and we'll uh, we'll uncover more. Even Devin Bush playing, I thought, a decent game and being aggressive and taking on pullers and. And, and being a more physical player. So there's one more uh, for you, David O. Missing Rod Woodson. He's in the XFL. He's out there. He's now coaching Martavis Bryant, the Vegas Vipers. But yeah, a Rod Woodson type would be great, but there aren't many guys like Rod Woodson, uh, David. Uh, Corey S., what for agent is an unpopular opinion of yours to not bring back? Um, With the way the season has gone, there's probably not many people that are jonesing for any one player to come back. In terms of the big name free agents, top of my head, I, I I saw the list that Dave tweeted earlier, but I don't have it all memorized. Larry Okunjobi, Cam Sutton are probably going to be uh, two of the biggest names, along with Terrell Edmonds and Devin Bush. I don't know if I have an unpopular opinion on in terms of a guy that should not come back. Um, maybe Okunjobi, but I'm not sitting there saying that he definitely should not come back. I just you know don't feel like maybe he has to come back. I think he's played well in pockets and moments, but... Um, is that a guy you're going to pay a ton of money to going forward? You know, we'll have to see. But, you know, Edmonds, would I welcome him back under circumstances? Sure, Bush. I mean, maybe Bush would become one because I think people, you know, are recognizing, and rightfully and accurately so, that he's played better this year. But my question's always been with Devin Bush. Is it better? Yes. Is it good enough? I don't really think so. I think you just, you move on. I think he has improved, but it's a pick that did not work out. It kind of has that still stain of the missed first round pick are you gonna let that guy hang around again depends on money depends on other circumstances but I guess I'm a little more of the let Bush go camp um, than maybe some others are but again I want to recognize his play has gone gotten better and I may do a video on that as well because I want to give Bush a little bit of credit um, for the improvement that he has made because he certainly has made improvement this year is replacing Dan Moore a priority, in your opinion? That's from Todd. No, I would not call that a priority. Uh, would I consider it? Sure, with that blue chip prospect in a top 10 situation? Uh, absolutely, I would consider it. Not saying I would do it, I would consider it. Uh, is it a priority? No, for me, priority number one with the O-line is left guard. So to answer that, uh, no, Todd. Double HH asking a similar question. Who is more expendable, Dan Moore or Kevin Dotson? Again, I, if I'm upgrading this offensive line, I'm starting at left guard. That is where I would start looking for solutions and upgrades. So um, that's been my stance for a while, and that continues to be my stance. Who is more easily and cheaply replaceable with an upgrade, either draft or for agency? Guards are always cheaper than tackles. Um, they don't go as high in the draft either, so that's a, a bit easier and more economical to replace. 
I'll uh, get one more super chat. I did get a super chat here from Chupa Thingy again, so thank you. Says, biggest issue I had was the inside draw from trips left and play action to the Y crossing six shards up. I could be looking too much into it. No, I mean, that's good. I, I mean, it's it's good to hear somebody offer something specific because with all the Canada critique and, and criticism and anger, I usually don't even get to that level of, of detail. So um, I'd have to go back and check some of those plays. Are you talking about the, the the failed inside draw where there was that miscommunication or another play? I'm not, not quite sure uh, what you're referring to there in the play action to the Y crossing six shards up. Again, I'd have, I'd have to think about what play that is off the top of my head. I don't remember exactly. They had uh, a Yankee concept of Pickens that hit well. They tried to work against the Saints and, and Pickett had and missed and they went back to it this week and and hit it, and that was uh, that was really good to see uh, overall. But I just have to think about some of those plays uh, overall. But nice to hear some some detail on that commentary. So appreciate that. Scrolling back on up, that's about a half hour left. Uh, Mike's asking me about Jalen Ramsey. What I give up first? Maybe Witherspoon other picks. Witherspoon I'm sure has very little value, so probably wouldn't do much. I don't know. Ramsey's getting a bit older, and he certainly can be still a great corner, but there's been some inconsistency in his game. I don't know about scheme fit and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, would you consider it? Sure, it's Jalen Ramsey. I don't think the Rams are in a big hurry to uh, to sell him, even despite their their tougher season. Uh, Mickle Markets, why in the world do we think linebackers can cover receivers? Why even take the risk? I mean, I didn't feel like that was a central issue in the Bengals game. Maybe it happened occasionally, but I think Pittsburgh's defended empty. Usually those those linebackers on receiver matchups have hurt Pittsburgh the most against empty sets, against teams that go heavy. They say they go 12 personnel, even 13 personnel. They push a receiver from uh, number one on the outside to number three in the slot. Pittsburgh wants to put a linebacker. They're playing zone, or they want to try to disguise their main coverage. They get a linebacker. On him, and that's when you have problems. The Jarvis Landry's, the Keenan Allen's, those kinds of things. Um, T. Higgins was making his plays against corners, against Levi Wallace, against Cam Sutton, against Arthur Millett. Um, Trenton Irwin had his touchdown on Millett, had that big 30 something yard catch and run on, on Levi Wallace. So Tyler Boyd made his plays on, generally speaking, on, on corners. So I don't really remember any one play where uh, linebackers got toasted by receivers. They got toasted by by the backs, by by P. Ryan, who had three touchdowns, and his blame is in a tackle, and Jack getting picked, and Bush getting smushed on a screen, and those kinds of things. So linebackers really couldn't cover backs in this game. Mixon with a good slant that went for 20 yards before he got hurt. Um, the linebackers couldn't cover the backs in this game. It was not really a receiver issue to me. All right, let's see what else we have here. Again, if you guys, well, I'll ask uh, one last call out to like the stream. Would appreciate that to get some more people in the chat. Uh, let's see. Don't understand why we had linebackers in coverage in when Mixon was out of the game a lot in the second half. Linebackers are going to have to cover. They're, they're, they're in Pittsburgh, you know, off-ball linebackers. And with most teams, they got to do everything. They got to play the run. They got to play the pass. They got to blitz occasionally. They got to, you know, do it all. So you got to. So they got to cover somebody, and it's better to cover running backs than than receivers, and they didn't do a good job of that, but um, I don't know what other alternative there really is there, Double HH. Uh, let's see, Dead Planet says, uh, while the outcome was certainly frustrating, I don't think there's any question. Pickett looked uh, way better last night than Week 10. I'm with you. I think I think he had a, a poor game against the Saints. I thought he was much better against the, Saint, uh, the uh, Bengals. And, and again, the first half was substantially better. Probably played his best half of football in the first half against Cincinnati. So that's um, a fair assessment there. David, who is your current pick to win the Super Bowl? My preseason prediction, uh, or my prediction right before the start of the regular season, was uh, Bills over Eagles, and that's basically where most people are at now. So hop on aboard. The Bills was a, not a trendy pick, but the Eagles, to me, I think I kind of went out on a limb there, thinking Jalen Hurts would put it together. So I will stick with my pick of Bills-Eagles because it's still looking pretty good after 11 weeks of the season. Cody's talking about the uh, Penn State left tackle. Yeah, I mean, I've heard about him. He's pretty young. I think he's 19, one-year starter, so will he declare? I'm not, not quite sure on, but point taken. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about him going forward. Uh, let's see. Double HH Brazil, Argentina, or a European team will hoist the World Cup. I wish I had a good answer. I do not know about the other football soccer is the... The other side of the pond calls. And I, it, it's so bad. I had the game on, on mute or it was kind of half paying attention, but it took me about a half hour watching the World Cup today between 
the U.S. and Wales to go, oh, the U.S. is on this side. I thought they were on the other side. So I was like, the U.S. is having a really bad first half. They're getting crushed. And then I realized, oh, that's that's the U.S. Um, who's been dominating. So that's my level of expertise and knowledge when it comes to the World Cup, um, not always knowing who's on what side and all those things. So uh, I do not know. We'll say, I'll say Brazil, but I do not take, take any advice from me. Run in the other direction. Uh, John, Alex, do you think this team needs to design plays for Pickens in the red zone to use his skill set on one-on-one plays and jumping ability and strong hands? Yeah, I'm sure to an extent. I was looking at red zone targets today, and Pickens is pretty far down there. Deontay has 11, and I think Fryermuth has 7, and then I think it's George Pickens. So there's probably some validity to that. So I have to, to dig into those things a bit more in terms of what they're calling. But yeah, I, I think that's that's probably a valid point, John. Uh, Ross Swisher, can you see the live stream now? You should be able to. It's showing up on my end, but if you guys aren't seeing the live stream, uh, please let me know, and I will see what's going on there. But as long as you guys can hear me, that's, I guess, the most important thing. But let me know if you guys can, uh, can see the live stream or have any issues with, with all of that. Uh, let's see, Dead Planet... Pickens also dropped arguably Kenny's nicest pass while inconsequential. Would have made Pickens' overall performance look that much better. Unfair to him. Yeah, that that deep ball left side was a great throw. The Pickens, very uncommon for him to drop. He's probably lost focus because the game was kind of over and you're mostly half going through the motions at that point. But yeah, I mean, Pickens' deep ball to me looked good. The uh, sluggo that was incomplete that would have been negated on the hold. Still not really sure what happened there if that's more on Pickett or Pickens. Sometimes the guy gets so open that it's harder to throw it to him because you're just trying to judge where he's going when there's no leverage or defensive back to kind of mark it for you. So I don't know what happened there, but I guess it would have been negated by the hold anyway, but that's a, a fair point at planet. Do you think Deontay's an afterthought on offense? Is he a number one? It certainly seems like Pickett looks for him less than what Trubisky um, has done. The numbers seem to bear that out to a degree. Um, I know Pickett talked about some of the coverages were, were dictated to take Johnson away with some of the two-man look or two high looks. So I, I have to go back and check through the tape. But um, Johnson has not been used well in this offense, somebody that has not been given many yak opportunities and has been really confined to more sideline-type routes. And that's not um, – he can win those, but that's not where he's at his best. He's not being used vertically much. He's only has uh, three uh, targets on, on – uh, or three catches of 20-plus yards this year. That's less than Chase Claypool had, and Claypool's not played in Pittsburgh for a couple of weeks. So I don't think Johnson's been used been used uh, specifically all that well this year, and he's certainly feeling frustrated uh, because of it. He's averaging 8.9 yards per catch, and that's a tight end number, not a number for ostensibly your number one receiver in your offense. Let me pull up uh, the PFF grades that Clayton – so diligently puts together for you guys to look at uh, defensively. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Alex, I felt like some of the issues with uh, kick coverage was because of the Boykin injury. Do you think that's true? I'm sure to an extent. Um, they were issues against the Saints, though, so they, they didn't start with this game. I had to, I'd have to go back through the special teams tape. I have not even opened uh, that tape yet to, to see some of those problems, but kick coverage has not been particularly strong probably a new kicker with a bit less of a leg that's not getting some touchbacks um is impacting that as much as any one particular coverage guy uh, do i really believe that moore can hold miles hendrickson and owe for six times a year i mean Moore's not a, an elite left tackle never be one i think he can be a good left tackle and he's still a second year guy that's improving and, and getting better and i think he's gotten better against garrett garrett still certainly had his wins and I was really annoyed by commentary last year that, that Moore played well against Miles Garrett. He did not. He was slightly better in the second game, but was not good in either game. Um, I'm just watching his progression, and I can certainly see the line of how much he's gotten better in terms of sacks I charge him for. I think I only have him down for two sacks this year when he allowed, I think he allowed like seven or eight the first half of his rookie season and then got better the back half. And just watching his comfort with Pat Meyer. Again, if there's an opportunity to get a franchise left tackle, then I'm, I'm going to jump on it. I don't think Moore's a franchise left tackle. He's not a Rashawn Slater. He's not an Andrew Whitworth. He's not you know, one of those caliber guys, but you know, the capital to get a, a left tackle is going to be tough to do. And if you have to stay with, with more as your left tackle, I think you could do a whole lot worse there, but I, I've really gone through the tape and really understanding what Pat Meyer wants and watching more grow from struggling in the summer with his, cause he was a two hand punch guy. That's how he's been taught and to go to independent hands and, and, and be able to, to work his hands well and refit his hands. He's done a really nice job of improving. And I can certainly see that in the tape. 
Uh, Mike, I think after watching them go to head to head yesterday, we can put the picket and Burrow comps. Burrow is light years more talented. No, I think he's more talented, but I mean, Burrow is also a couple years into his career with the Super Bowl appearance, and Burrow's rookie year didn't go that great before the injury. So, you know, it, it's it's not exactly a one to one comparison, obviously, based on where they're at in their career arc. So, yeah, I think Burrow is probably more talented, but not not considerably so. Um, and has some better weapons and, and an offensive line that's improving and a better run game and those kinds of things uh, as well. But but obviously, you know, Burrow's the more talented, and I would take Joe Burrow any day over the uh, of the week over Kenny Pickett as things stand right now. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, Ross Fisher, I would say Bush is not scared of contact. I don't know if he ever was. I think he was hesitant and overthinking and not wanting to make a mistake, but uh, he's not scared of contact this year. And I think sometimes he gets brain freezes where he just kind of doesn't know what to do, and I think you've seen still some negative plays there. But uh, there's one play that I retweeted that uh, I know Josh Carney has watched live and pointed out of him putting the center Ted Karras on his butt on a, on a pin and pull scheme. And that is not a guy who's afraid of contact. Guys who are afraid of contact don't make those kinds of plays. And I've seen Bush do a lot better job of getting downhill and being aggressive and things like that. So um, I would not agree at all that Bush is, is afraid of contact. Tim Chase, at what point do you think the Steelers will recognize they're playing for next year and play Mark Robinson? Uh, probably not at all. I really don't think they're going to play Robinson on defense this year unless injuries force their hand. Even late in the year, um, is that guy ready? The first question is before you ask anything else is, is Mark Robinson ready to play defense? And usually those guys got to work their way up the ladder. You're not going to give a guy snaps just to give a guy snaps unless injuries are forcing you to. So I know I'm excited about Robinson. I thought he had a good camp. I like the traits that he has, but I'm not I'm not really jonesing for this guy to play defense right now. He's got a lot to learn. He was playing running back just, just two years ago, one-year linebacker at Ole Miss. So um, he's got a ways to go, and I understand that, and I'm not going to not gonna be in a hurry for a guy that needs some time. Chupa Thingies with a $5 Super Chat giving me some soccer information. Brazil is the favorite for the Cup. Argentina for Messi, a close second. Me personally, I'm all in on England. U.S. won't make it past the 16 uh, KO. I know they... Apparently that that tie against Wales was disappointing given their first half play and they were expected to win that game. Um, so I guess that's the the book there. I saw England had the big win six two over Ireland. Is that who they played today? So that's um, that's about all the knowledge I have in terms of uh, the World Cup. All right, scrolling back up here, about twenty minutes left in the live streams. So appreciate you guys being here. Um, also, I'm not going to guarantee anything, but for everybody who's here, I've not done my video that'll come out hopefully for tomorrow yet. What would you guys like to see in terms of my next film breakdown? Um, is it something on Pickett, something on the defense? I have have not decided on what I want to do a film room breakdown for YouTube and for the, the site on. So if you guys have any suggestions for what you would like to see in terms of a player or a play or some sort of concept, um, let me know in the chat. And I will certainly take that into consideration when I come to deciding on what my next video uh, should be. All right, let's see what else we have here for you guys. Alex, do you think Canada is hurting the growth of the, of the receivers, not using them correctly? I think he's not meshing well with what Johnson um, can do, needs to do where he thrives the best and wins the most. So I think it's probably one guy who's being hurt by the structure of this offense. Is Pickens being hurt by the structure? I don't think so overall. I don't think Frymouth is being hurt. I think Frymouth is being used properly and well. And the other receivers, there really isn't a lot of information on, and it doesn't probably matter a whole lot when it comes to Olszewski and Sims, and those guys are being used as their slot, gadgety space players. So, um, yeah, I think Johnson's being hurt, but that's probably the extent of it overall. Iran. Okay, it was 6-2 over, over Iran, so so there you go. My bad. I just saw I something, and I just guessed without really paying much attention. Should have looked at the flag there. Uh, let's see what else we have here for you guys. Dead Planet, last thought, really would have been interesting if Calvin Austin saw the field. Sure, I would have been excited to see just something to learn more from him other than a dud of a rookie year and two weeks in training camp is all we kind of have to go off of when it comes to Calvin Austin's first season. So, unfortunate for him. Get back healthy for OTAs for the spring, and we'll see him next camp, and hopefully the speed's still there, and he looks no worse for wear coming off of foot surgery. Don't know the extent of the, the surgery, but obviously enough to shove him for the year.
I think Burrow had struggles his rookie year, and uh, the offensive line certainly played a factor in that. But you watch that Steelers game uh, that Burrow played before he got hurt, the way they were playing two-man, forcing sideline throws. Burrow did not play well in that game. And so you kind of felt like, was it arm strength going to be a limiter, uh, limiting factor in that game? Um, now he's improved, and having Jamar Chase certainly helps. But I mean, I, I don't know if Burrow's struggling to the, deg- to the degree that Pickett is struggling, but I think Burrow had... Uh, kind of a turbulent rookie year, which again is common, um, but definitely, I mean, I think Burrow's the more talented player, and I answered that uh, pretty clearly. Uh, does Bush another contract? It depends on price. It'd have to be cheap. Certainly would have to be the right price, but I'm still going to say no right now, but he has certainly improved. Double HH, I'd like to see how Najee has improved the last two weeks uh, versus the first two weeks. Yeah, it's not a bad idea. It would take maybe some doing, uh, and the line certainly is, is partially dependent on that, but but good point there. Film room breakdown on the pass blocking from the running backs. That's some Chupa thingy. Okay, yeah, I mean, Jalen War not being the third down back, so Harris kind of had to do most of it. Benny Snell seeing his first offensive snaps of the season, so that was a a role for him, and if Warren does not play, and that hamstring certainly could prevent him from playing, then Benny Snow may pick up some more third-down snaps uh, as well. Uh, Pickett, I want to know what he saw on those misses. Maybe make sense of some of the bad throws. Yeah, certainly Pickett stuff always, always popular and always something I'm considering doing. I don't want to oversaturate things, but I haven't done one. Didn't do one last week, so um, maybe we'll do one again. Alex, what game would you shut down the veteran starters and give some rookies or practice squad players some snaps to see who to bring back? I mean, I would never really shut those guys down unless it's an injury that's dictating that. The later you get into a year, maybe you do some rotational stuff and, and a little bit of a look-see on these guys. But um, I don't. it would depend on, on the player, the situation, the, the young guy's readiness. Again, if they're not ready to play, if they're not uh, expected to play, well, if they're not earning that, and I'm not going to give a guy reps just to give a guy reps. I understand the thought of give a, uh, give a young guy a chance and evaluate him, um, but unless you're earning it or somebody is is not deserving of more reps, if you're making a change for, I guess, one guy that's playing is not playing well, then then you make a change. But not giving reps just to, to give out reps and, and, and for no you know valid reason. Jonathan Mason, random, but if you had to guess who decides when the Steelers wear the color rush uniforms, I imagine that's an Art Rooney call. I mean, it always corresponds with uh, home games and maybe other events that are occurring, but I imagine Rooney gets final say on on the jersey situation and when they wear all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see. The Bengals wide receiver signed during the bye week really hurt the Steelers. The secondary didn't do well at all. Yeah, I assume that's Trenton Irwin. Yeah, that's not a guy I was very familiar with at all. So he had two big catches, a touchdown, that sprint out where he's a secondary read, makes that play on Millette, who certainly uh, was toasted in that game. And then the uh, catch and run on Levi Wallace right side on that 93 yard drive was a big one as well. $5 Super Chat from Morgan Bradley. Thank you so much, Morgan. I know you, re- you were here last time, so really appreciate you being here again, and certainly uh, thank you for the, the Super Chat. Will William Jackson III improve the pass defense? Potentially. He seems like a very boom-bust corner, and obviously he's hurt right now and out for at least another, what is it, two more games at the least. So by the time he gets back, you know, we'll see what the state of everything looks like. But, um, you know, could he make some plays? He could, but I think he'll probably make some bad plays as well, probably be... A little Witherspoon, like in that regard. Greg Locke do a breakdown on how all three linebackers gave up a touchdown to the running back. Yeah, I mean that's yeah Bush. Now Bush got shoved, but you know he got to make the play, got to stay in your feet, and 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 Spillane missing that tackle and Jack getting picked. You're right, all three linebackers um, allowing touchdowns in, in in that sense of it. So that would be something to look at. What is Leal's position on the defense when he returns? It's a, it's a good question. Probably won't see much of that 3-3-5. Three, three, Maybe a little bit because it was, you know, semi-effective um, whenever Leal was deployed there. But during camp, he was an interior lineman, a three-tech, and that's probably where they want him to be and probably where they're going to try to play him more of um, in passing situations, sub-package roles, and things like that. So probably more three-tech. But, you know, I think they showed with him being given more of an opportunity, he was kind of able to show his athleticism and move around. He played some off-ball linebacker in some specific blitz packages against the Bills, so um, I think showcasing what he can do and maybe he can be more than just an interior defense lineman, but I think that's where they want to get him back to, to really kind of 
hone his craft along the interior and really improve his pass rush move and plan. He's a high-energy guy. He has a good effort guy. He's got active hands, but does not really have a move or any sort of plan right now and um, hasn't really led to a lot of actual production. He's bad some passes down, but in terms of getting to the quarterback, still uh, a lot of work to do there with DeMarvin Leal, but we knew he was kind of a, a bit of a, a lump of clay when they drafted him. Let's see what else we have here. Any other questions? Jonathan Mason, would you agree that Pickett's biggest limitation is overall arm strength? Seems like he has the accuracy and confidence. Feel like he can be quarterback 10-15 in this league maybe. Yeah, I said whenever he came out, um, when I did my pre-draft projection uh, of Pickett and I didn't have him incredibly highly ranked. I said best case, he's probably like a, a car. He's probably a top 10 in a, in a best case. Could he ever be a top 5, you know, real elite quarterback? Probably not. So, you know, I think that's probably where I'm at as well, Jonathan. But again, I'm still evaluating and analyzing and not concluding and trying to, to box guys into anything right now. In terms of his base, biggest limitation, um, his arm's certainly not tremendous, but I really don't see it as, I haven't seen it as a limitation. I think he's made some good throws downfield. You saw the throws to, to Pickens and uh, the touchdown and the throw against the Saints to Deontay. Um, he's never going to have a, a howitzer for an arm, but you know, if you're going to talk about, if you're going down the checklist of things a quarterback has to have, arm strength is not incredibly important. I just think in terms of, you see the top quarterbacks in the league who can really make those insane, you know, off script, outside of structure plays, Pickett's probably not going to be that guy. And I understand that's a tough thing to do. And, and there aren't a lot of guys who can do it. And, and there's so much more to quarterback than just making the crazy Mahomes, no look type throw or the Josh Allen run over four guys kind of play. Um, but the top quarterbacks in football really have that unique ability to 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 put the team on their back, to go all Craig Jennings and and make those just, you know, highlight real plays. And will Pickett ever be that guy? Probably not. That's why I was a fan of Malik Willis. Understanding that Willis was a is a classic boom bust type player and certainly could be as good or as bad as possible. I mean he has a really high floor and a really high ceiling. A really low floor, I guess is how I should phrase that. Um but he was a guy that makes those high-level, jaw-dropping type plays that the top quarterbacks in football um, make on a, on a regular basis. And that's kind of what drew me to Malik Willis. But again, we're watching all these guys, and we'll see how it plays out. If Alu Ali retires, then will Ogunjobi slide to nose tackle? No, he's on a nose tackle. And plus, Ogunjobi's a free agent after this year. Alu Ali almost certainly will retire, but uh, he's also a free agent. Um, but Ogunjobi is on expiring contract, a one-year deal he signed. So we'll have to see what happens to him. But if he does uh, re-up, uh, he will be used as a as a defensive tackle in that kind of Stephon Tua type role. Ross Swisher, Montrevis had a good rep, but where has he been all year, Alex? Yeah, that was a good rep to blow up the center and, and get in the backfield. He's, he's got a good first step, a good burst for a guy his frame and size. Um, but yeah, he's not been, it hasn't been shown enough now. You know, how many snaps has he gotten? He was the, the backup to start the year, getting 10 snaps a game. And, you know, against the Bengals, they didn't play a lot of base de- uh, base defense because the Bengals are, even without Jamar Chase, a predominant 11 personnel, three receiver type team. They were in that probably 90% of their snaps in this game until the, the last uh, couple of plays there. So um, didn't get a lot of opportunity. He probably had fresh legs, and that allows you to get off the ball a little bit quicker. But but not seen enough from the nose tackle with all the wall that was not played well this year. And Adams has been... Just okay and not really gotten much of an impact as a pass rusher, although he's not gotten a lot of opportunity with this group being healthier than where it was when he came in last year. 007, why so many penalties on crucial drives on the short fields nonetheless? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, some of it's technique, some of it's miscommunication. The ineligible man downfield penalty was off miscommunication. You had the hold on Frymouth, which I thought was a little questionable, but it is what it is. Um, penalties have hurt this team so much this year, especially since the Dolphins game. And this offense, when things go right, when they play mistake free, it's, it's still a pretty bad offense. And certainly you compound penalties and turnovers into that. They, they can't afford any of those. The margin for error is so thin with this offense right now. It's unbelievable. So, um, penalties at any time for this offense really destroys them. And that's been the case in, in several of these games, the Eagles game, the first half of that one, the second half of the Dolphins game, and also, um, the second half of the Bengals game. Does your charting indicate a percentage of snaps for Spillane? It feels like he's on the field a lot relative to Jack and Bush for the life of me. I don't know why he's on the field on third down. Yes, he's been, we have that number. I don't have it off the top of my head in terms of um, 
his percentage. It's been he's been the dimebacker for essentially the entire season whenever he's been healthy and available. Um, and and why that is, is is a very good question. I know he's a good communicator and he's a smart player, and they probably like and value that. They they liked all three other inside linebackers. They were, were rotating them um, daily during training camp, and so they wanted to find ways to get all three guys on the field. Probably not overburden any one of those guys. And again, they they prioritize and they like Blaine's headiness and football IQ and communication ability, and that's important um, in dime packages and some of his blitz game stuff and things like that. Now, yesterday, for the first time, I think all year, um, they kind of did their training camp rotation of rotating those guys out basically every other series, where it was um, Jack and Bush to start, and then Bush and Spillane were the next series, and I think it was uh, Spillane and Jack the next series, so you kind of saw more of that true three-man rotation there. We'll see if that continues. Um, but that was a bit different than what this team had been doing. Nick Navy, how do you think Andy Weidel's draft strategy or personnel preferences differ from how Colbert built the team? Do you think his draft pool is more than an index card that Colbert relied on? Yeah, I'm sure it's different. Um, again, I can pull up, if you want to read more about Andy Weidel, I can pull it up here for you, Nick. I did a, a deep dive into trying to learn as much as I could about Andy Weidel and kind of what makes him tick. And I wrote this article back in late May, shortly after the hire, called The Big Book of Andy Weidel that talks about his influences, his upbringing, um, the places he's been, the jobs he's had, and things like that. Generally speaking, trench guy, edge guy, he wants pass rushers, he wants offensive linemen. That's sort of the way he's built this whole thing. I imagine he will be more aggressive in terms of trades, especially trading down. Kevin Colbert occasionally would go up, almost never traded down. I'm going to guess Weidel's going to be more open to to moving down. Colbert was very much, if you're going to trade down, you know, you have to have, let's say you trade down four spots, there's got to be four guys you love to take there so you don't get, um, you know, screwed over by uh, somebody stealing your picks right ahead of you. So I think Weidel's going to be more open to that and probably more analytically approached him and Omar Khan and, um, not be quite the whole watching the tape they will do, and it'll be important, of course, but they're going to look at the numbers and, and probably utilize the numbers a bit more than, than what Kevin Colbert ever did. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Latimok, is he going to get cut next year? We'll see. I mean, the defensive line room is going to open up. Um, Alu Alu is going to retire, and Ogan Joby. We'll see what happens there. Chris Warmly is going to be a free agent. I, I think he could come back, but we'll have to see. Um, so there could be an opening for Latimok, but it's been tough for him to get an opportunity. He played two snaps yesterday, and they were both the kneel downs. So he's got kneel down experience uh, coming out of this game. Would I bring back Anthony Miller? I mean, a futures deal, I guess, but probably not. You know, older guy, shoulder surgery. I'll go find somebody else. Uh, Mason money for a left tackle. Mason isn't making that much money. Good left tackles get paid. Bad left tackles get paid. Good left tackles get paid a crazy amount of money. So, going to have to be a lot more money. Oh, use as in Mason Cole. Well, Cole's only making five million per year, and again, left tackles still cost a lot more than that. Let's see any more questions here? About five minutes left. It seemed like Kenny literally just shut Deontay Johnson out last night, and it feels like there's something going on between the two. What do you think, Alex? Um. Johnson certainly was not involved in this offense. His first touch didn't come until that jet run on third and one that he picked up. And I think he only had like two catches by the half. So not really gotten involved much. I don't think there's anything going on between the two. I think Johnson's frustrated by his lack of involvement. And Trubisky did target Johnson more. But I don't think there's some sort of grudge or anything like that. Um, I don't think that's the case. I don't have any you know firsthand knowledge of that. But that's not, not what I'm thinking. Again, I'll have to go back and check the tape. I think that Pickett... Likes throwing to George Pickens, and that's worked well and, you know, continues to do that and likes Fryermuth as well, as he should. Uh, this team, team reminds me of the 80 Steelers talent here and there, but just collectively not good enough to seriously compete for the Super Bowl. But yeah, that's fair. I mean, that's post-Bradshaw. They were 80s, and for a whole decade, they were pretty mediocre until, uh, until the 90s. And even then, it was still up and down. So fair point there. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Alu Alu say he ain't done. Did you see that pass deflection? Yeah, I mean, it was good to see that the D-line 
uh, deflect passes and impact uh, Burrow and the quarterback, despite not always getting to the quarterback. I mean, they've been, Cam Hayward's been working so hard for pass deflections, putting his hands up the entire year, has one, did not have one in that game against the Bengals, but they got five of them. They had Jack and Watt with a pick and um, Alu Alu, as you mentioned. So that was good to see them making some plays there. But Alu Alu, unfortunately, just not the same guy. Father time, the history of the ankle sprains and MCL sprains and the fractured ankle, just going to going to get to you after time but a great career for Tyson Alualu and um, this almost certainly will be his last in the NFL all right let's see what else we have here looks like there probably aren't any questions left if you guys have a last second question you can uh, feel free to ask it if you want to see a recap of this you can go back and check the site we'll post that in just a little bit Mikel Jones, I hate that Jalen Warren got hurt. He really uh, brings that change of pace that we need and Najee needs. Yeah, um, he's certainly worked his way in this offense and has carved out a third down role since the Bills game and has increased his early down role uh, starting last week. And so to not have him, now Najee's a guy who's capable of playing all those snaps. I wasn't too upset. or I mean, it was, you never want to see a guy get hurt, but I knew this team could survive without Jalen Warren in this game um, based on what Najee can do. But you want to have both guys. It's been good for both of, of them, and hopefully Warren gets back soon. But the hamstring injuries can be multi-week things, as Witherspoon is finding out. So we'll have to see what Mike Tomlin says on Tuesday. Mr. ABS, did, did I miss your question? Let me scroll back up and see if I... Uh, there you go. I'm sorry. Would you say the last non-elite quarterback to win a Super Bowl was Nick Foles, maybe Flacco a bit before? Do we honestly feel Pickett can at least be one of them if we have a top... If we have a choice of a top quarterback, do you take one? Um, yeah, yes, the Foles, uh, remembering my Super Bowl winners correctly, um, that's probably accurate. I mean, yeah, point taken, I think, you know, quarterbacks drive your bus. They, they are the, you know, everyone's looking for a quarterback. You're in two camps. Either you have a franchise quarterback or you're looking for a franchise quarterback. And if you're not in that, that first camp, then you're, you're probably not a real serious Super Bowl competitor unless you just get great luck or a tr- tremendous defense or whatever the case is. So, yeah, point taken on that, and that was my reservation on Kenny Pickett. He was my number four quarterback in this class. Um, now, I'm not saying that really matters at this point anymore. We're just watching them in the NFL, but I didn't know if that ceiling was so immense where you know you kind of felt like you would be in a Kirk Cousins car, best-case scenario. You'd be a good team but not a great team and kind of be in this quarterback purgatory if things broke perfectly, and so that was my concern with Kenny Pickett, and so I understand that concern now. Do I take a quarterback if I have the opportunity to? A, probably won't be in that position to kind of deflect on the question. I think you know this team will not be picking first overall or second overall, so take Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud out of the equation in terms of the top quarterbacks in this class. Um, and I think Kenny Pickett will be given at least through 2023 to show if he can or can't be the guy before this team makes any decision. I don't see Josh Rosen 2.0 happening in the sense of a first-round quarterback in one year and then replacing him with a first-round quarterback in the next, the way the Cardinals did with Kyler Murray replacing Josh Rosen. Let's see what else we have here. Would I rather bring back Edmonds or Sutton? Again, price tags are probably going to be considerably different. Edmonds played for really cheap this year. His market may have gone up a little bit after this year, but probably not by that much. Sutton should cost more, not a crazy amount of money, but still playing that cornerback spot, having a, a decent year overall. Not a particularly good game yesterday, but who would I rather have? For Sutton, if you made me choose. I mean, you know, there's arguments for both, and there's a, there's a cost-benefit thing. And again... If you if you re-sign Sutton and Wallace is back, you know, Witherspoon you probably cut, but you find that number one corner, you know, I probably you could still make it work. Yeah. I, I would I'd rather have Sutton, but it, it it's still I would still want and have a number one corner very much on the board of things I need to add to this defense. So so that's my answer there. Do we bring up McFarland uh now? They could. Um if Warren's not gonna play. Going to need three backs, so they probably could. Tomlin at home Monday night is pretty automatic, right? That is a road game, correct? Someone could correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that is in Indy. They played two home games. They're on the road for a little bit. So um, that is in Indianapolis, if I'm remembering the schedule correctly. Who makes biggest second year jump on the team? Um, That's a good question. I'm not really sure. Firemuth, maybe. I think it's just the way they've used him has been better. I don't know if the actual play has maybe changed all that much, but conceptually, he's being used more vertically. I mean, Loudermilk, Norwood, Harvin, Najee would not be the answer in terms of second-year jump. Yeah, it might be not Kendra Green. 
Uh, Dan, uh, Dan Moore. I'll say Dan Moore. That, there's the answer there. Dan Moore has made the, the biggest second-year jump. Am I ready for the barn burner next Monday night? Yeah. Uh, I love staying up till 4 a.m. watching Colt Steelers. That's going to be great. <laughs> Uh, defend the guy. I don't have to defend the guy. I mean, if that's if that's Pickett you're referring to, I mean, I've said good things about Pickett. I've said bad things about Pickett, and we'll keep watching, analyzing, and see where this thing goes. Uh, let's see. Have I ever ever thought about fantasy football content? Uh, that's from Mikkel. No, because I'm really bad at fantasy football. I mean, my teams have been okay, but my advice is usually pretty poor. There was a several years back. There was a guy. I think on maybe Facebook or Twitter or something. He would he got my DMs and my messages and was asking for advice. And I would give him my advice, and I was wrong like every single week. And eventually he stopped asking, and he was correct to do so. So um, I don't want to give that stuff out. Uh, I, I, I don't know how anyone works in the business of like being Matthew Barry or any fantasy football analyst because that's a job where you're just going to be wrong a certain section of the time. Even the guys who are good are probably going to be wrong 33 to 40 to 50% of the time because there's just so much you can't control. Like, if I predict the Steelers to be wrong, who cares? That has no bearing on anything. If you if you say, start this guy, and people go out there and do it, and he has a dud of a game, you get so much criticism, I'm, I'm sure, uh, from people that, you know, you felt like they, they got screwed over because their team lost or whatever. If you say, sit this guy or draft this guy, and it doesn't work out, you're just, it's baked into the cake of the job. You're going to be wrong an obscenely high amount of the time, and it's going to be consequential where people are always going to be angry at you because you're never going to be 100%. And I just could not be in that position to, because I always focus on my wrongs more than my my rights. And um, I would I would just dwell on all that I got wrong and all the people that were impacted by that. And if it was money on the line, then I would feel even worse. And so could never, ever do fantasy football content. You should not take advice, fantasy uh, advice from me there because I would be very bad at it. All right, let's see what else we have here. Uh, let's, uh, are we going to create an app for Steelers Depot? Maybe. I know Dave and I have talked about it, but so much else to do, especially in season, so much going on, so not, no immediate plans for that. Uh, Rajan39. Uh, do we t- two top corners? At least one, I would say, at least one. But again, finding that, that top corners, a lot easier for me to say from the comfort of my office and my a big comfy chair as opposed to going out there and, and doing it and finding that guy and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, all right, yeah, it's going to probably wrap things up here. Um, yeah, enjoy the Thanksgiving. Dave and I will be back two weeks from now, so whenever that is, the, the week after the Colts game, whatever the dates are for that. But appreciate you guys watching. If you want to uh, subscribe to the channel for more content, um, we'll hopefully have a video dropping tomorrow. I don't know. I have no idea what the video is going to be on. But appreciate you guys hanging out with us, and uh, you can find an archive version of this on the channel in a little bit and on Steagles Depot as well, as you guys see the site. A lot of content going up. Encourage you guys to go over to the site, have some stuff on Deontay Johnson's a tough season, uh, some reaction from Ben on his latest podcast with some comments on Kenny Pickett and, and Ben being a believer in Kenny Pickett and also in George Pickens. So you guys can check that out um, as well. So appreciate you guys watching. And again, be sure to subscribe to the channel and we'll talk to you soon.